Hello! In the last tutorial we were implementing a simple model of uh, 2D vector alignment on a grid. We were using Google Colab, Python and TensorFlow 2. Today I'm going to implement the same model but using a different tool. I'll be using ShaderToy website. So what's ShaderToy? ShaderToy is a playground and also a social network where shader developers share their creations and learn from each other, show various tricks they've invented. And what is a shader? Shaders are tiny programs that run on parallel processes of graphics processing units or GPUs. And on shader toy, people write those tiny programs that uh, run on GPUs and in the early days of shader toy, those were purely functional programs that were mapping pixel coordinate and a time into an animation. All pixels running independently without com uh, communicating. And can you imagine that uh, with uh, a little bit more than two hundreds of lines of code, uh, people at this website are able to make stuff like this. So the visual here is implemented in this program that I'm scrolling through. And um, all it takes is a current pixel coordinate and uh, the current time in order to produce this visual. And this massive parallel programming model is something that uh, changed my perception of computing a little bit, well, quite a lot when I learned about it. Uh, this website was created by a person whose name is Ingo Quiles, I hope I pronounced it right, and uh, he has a website that contains a lot of resources um, that uh, you can learn shader programming from. Uh, a lot of articles on computer graphics and also there are some video tutorials. So um, I think that knowing uh, shader programming is very useful for anyone who is either in parallel computing or in data visualization. Because this uh, knowing this, these languages, uh, well, Shader Tor uses JLSL, gives tremendous flexibility and uh, power. Well, uh, one of the examples that I was uh, using uh, JLSL is uh, this, uh, this uh, visualization that we made uh, together with uh, Nicola Pizzotti, who was my intern back then, uh, that uh, was showing the relationship between uh, 3D model uh, space and UV coordinate space in this uh, animated transition that made the process very intuitive. This was uh, a part of our differentiable image parameterizations publication. Later, the computational model of Shader Toy was extended with uh, full uh, with off-screen buffers that allow pixels to have some state that evolves uh, between the frames, and this uh, opened uh, ways for simulating various physicals or self-organizing systems. And this is one of examples, uh, recent examples, that shows uh, some cells that emerge from uh, background and then they traverse the space and uh, collide with each other, change their directions, look very lifelike. So this platform is very useful for uh, quick hacks experiments like this. 
or for various visualization experiments. Now let's proceed to coding by creating a new shader. You see that I'm already logged in into the platform and while programming I'll be explaining some features of shader toy. So the new shader consists of a single function that takes pixel coordinates and must produce the uh, pixel or fragment color for uh, each uh, pixel on screen. And this function is evaluated for all pixels independently. It can get information about environment from some uh, predefined variables that are called uniforms. And uh, one of them is screen resolution. Another is uh, current uh, time value. And actually by pressing this question mark sign, we can get information about uh, language and also the list of input variables. So for example, the current time and uh, number of the current frame. Also, we can get information about mouse position. Um, there are additional ways to get environment information, such as keyboard information or order input, but they implemented through texture lookups. So uh, we can tweak those, uh, this source code, like let's multiply this uh, value by 20 and see what happens. We increased the frequency, the spatial frequency of those uh, cosines that were displayed on a plot. And now this is a stateless purely functional program. What we need is to create an off-screen buffer that will hold the state of cells between frames. So uh, I'm pressing this plus sign and adding buffer A. So you can create up to four buffers and also one cube map buffer in shader toy, but we only need one and they're all equivalent. So uh, now we want to display the contents of buffer A on an image. So we need to connect the channel zero, text to channel zero of our image shader to buffer A. We do it by selecting buffer A in this window and closing it. So now we can get access to buffer A by uh, treating it as a texture. So we can replace this by a texture lookup. We now see that the screen is filled with blue color and the reason is that uh, the buffer A in is uh, filled by blue color. So uh, for channels R, G, B for blue and A is for alpha, but alpha we don't see it here. So this means that uh, we can store up to four po floating point values uh, for a pixel in uh, in a single buffer and we may have up to four buffers uh, on shader toy. Now here we are reading the channel zero that assigned to buffer A and we are using UV coordinates for uh, the current pixel. Now let's uh, initialize this uh, buffer with some random vectors. And uh, JLSL, the language is used, that is used for shader programming, doesn't have uh, random function. And the way random functions are generated uh, in shader programming are hashes. So let's, uh, let's find some good hash functions uh, for us. And uh, this shader by Dave uh, Hoskins is a very good reference. Oops. Uh, is a very good reference for various uh, hash functions uh, that are useful as random number generators on Shader Toy. So uh, hash function takes uh, pixel position and produces some uh, noise-like uh, value and. There is a number of variants of these functions uh, that uh, differ in the number of dimensions of the random uh, of the coordinate vectors they receive and the number of random values, random value channels they produce. So, uh, for example, if we take the function that uh, takes uh, three input and produces one output, 
and uh, copy it in our shader for buff buffer A. Uh, we now have something like uh, white noise uh, that actually gets rendered into buffer A on each frame and then uh, gets copied uh, on screen with the image shader. Uh, but actually we don't need to rewrite the uh, state of the buffer each frame. We want to uh, set it to random vectors on the frame zero and then uh, continue with a different rule that will implement our vector alignment model. So let's uh, use frame counter to determine what are we going to do on each step. But uh, important detail that in order to uh, perform update of the buffer we need to get access to its previous value so we connect the buffer to itself because uh, in WebGL you can't render and uh, to the buffer and read it as a texture at the same time so actually there are going to be two separate buffers that will uh, take different roles depending on frame one is being read and the other is being written to and then they switch and now um, let's implement the buffer initialization. Okay, now we see that our pattern become static because we uh, we only generate random uh, numbers on the frame zero we set the fragment color to the random value and return. Otherwise, we are just copying the color value from the state of the buffer on the previous iteration. And uh, for demonstration purposes, we may do something like, uh, let's uh, read a previous buffer state And then now we are uh, incrementally adding uh, 0 0.01 uh, by module 1 uh, to each pixel, causing them to cycle from uh, black to uh, white and back to black uh, in, with a varying phase. Now we can impl start implementing our model and in order to do that we will implement average pooling. Oh, actually before implementing average pooling we need to set pixels to uh, two-dimensional vectors rather than uh, scalars. So let's convert those uh, random values into 2D vectors. We need to restart the shader so that it um, get back to the frame zero and let's uh, remove our color cycling. So now uh, red and green channels of the grid contain the cosine and sine of alpha correspondingly. We may uh, implement the mapping of vector directions uh, to RGB that we uh, were using uh, in our call-up tutorial in our image visualization shader. So we can multiply the result of texture fetch by 0 0.5 and add 0 0.5. Now we have similar co colors on visualization. Um, let's proceed to implementing the model of vector alignment. First do average pooling.
Okay, now we see that the grid slowly blurs uh, when we restart the shader. The noise gets filtered. And uh, what I've implemented here is a function that's called average pool that receives coordinates of a current fragment and iterates over its 3x3 three three neighborhood, accumulating the uh, red uh, xy values and then dividing them by the number of values so we accumulated. And I also implemented a separate read function that uh, encapsulates the uh, texture lookup and uh, texture coordinate transformation and returns only uh, two first components of uh, fetched vectors. Uh, now let's implement normalization. Actually there is a dedicated function for L2 normalization in JLSL that's called normalize. Yeah, that's all it took to implement almost exactly the same model that we had uh, in Colab and TensorFlow. You see that we are really uh, working at way lower level here. We are manually implementing those primitives. But on the other hand, we get much greater flexibility. For example, uh, you may remember that I told that uh, the uh, aligned oscillators, phase aligned accelerators models that were, were, was computing nonlinear operation across uh, each uh, pixel neighborhood uh, is much trickier to implement with TensorFlow, but it's actually very easy to implement with JLSL where you have direct control on the uh, data access and operation that gets performed for each pixel. You may notice that there is some strange symmetry that we are observing in this region around this diagonal. And, well, don't know the exact reason, but probably, well, the, the reason is uh, imperfection of our hash function that is not producing completely random values for some reason. I don't want to dig too much into details uh, of why it's happening, but as a quick fix, I'll just uh, add a couple of large random values, well, large constants to shift us away from this um, region around zero. Let's see how it, oops, back to, let's see how it works for us. Well, looks, uh, at least I don't observe any symmetries now. That's a good moment to save our shader and that's uh, all I have for today. Here is a URL of our new shader. Uh, thank you for listening, hope it was useful. And in the next tutorial I'd like to show how to um, make zoom in effects to closely uh, explore the states of cells in a visualization shader. So thank you again for attention.